Hello, I'm DJ Rao, and this presentation is part of a five-part series that introduces C++ to programmers who already have some exposure to programming. So note that these are not very introductory programming tutorials, but instead they're designed to provide a rapid introduction to concepts in C++ so that you can quickly ramp up on programming in C++. Let's start with a basic overview of C++. C++ essentially extends the C programming language. So learning C++ implies you have to learn some of the basic concepts of C. However, C and C++ are very different in many ways, and in this presentation we'll be focusing more on C++. The C++ language has been designed so that it can be easily compiled to assembly and then run on a machine code. So the C++ programs are designed to directly run on native hardware. Assembly and C++ can be intermixed with each other, and this gives maximum flexibility to tap into the power of the CPU, and that was one of the primary design motivations of C++, is to enable the most efficient operation of programs on modern CPUs. The language is very mature, and it's one of those few languages that still go through a very rigorous standardization process, and it is an international committee of people and companies who standardize the language. It is one of the most portable and interoperable languages and runs practically on almost every hardware platform that we have today. And there are thousands and thousands of libraries and tools that have been developed for C++. Many of the core software systems that we use today are developed in C++. So this includes like operating systems, network stacks and protocols, databases, web browsers, compilers. So almost the entire cyber infrastructure that we're using today has been developed in C and C++. And so it is kind of important to understand the operations of this language so we can continue to maintain the cyber infrastructure that we are all so reliant on. Even many of the modern uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning libraries, including those that are used via Python, are all developed in C++. This includes the popular PyTorch machine learning library, TensorFlow from Google, they're all developed in C++. And of course, they are wrapped in Python to make it easier for non-computing people to quickly use AI and machine learning in business and other statistical applications. So learning C and C++ is kind of very important so that we can fully utilize the software systems that are available today. Let's start with the basic ideas of data types because C++ is a very strongly typed language. There are several primitive data types. The first one is Boolean, so it basically stores true and false values. The next one are signed numeric data types, and these store both positive and negative numbers. Character, integer, and long are basically integer data types as in integral data types, they do not store fractional values. Float double and long double store fractional values at different precisions. Note that long double is two words, but it's a single data type, so the names of data types can have multiple words in C++. C++ also has unsigned numeric data types. These cannot store negative values, but they give a much bigger range of values when compared to the signed counterparts. So notice the word unsigned in front of each one of these. So there is unsigned character, unsigned integer, unsigned long, and also size t. And size t or size underscore t is just an alias for unsigned long, and you will see size underscore t used uh, a lot with strings or vectors and such as we go through this presentation. So keep the size underscore t in mind, it's very important. And bear in mind, it's just an unsigned long, that means it can store a very long range, or two terabytes worth of uh, range is what uh, unsigned long can represent. Of course, the standard mathematical expressions and operators are addition, subtraction, multiplication, division, and modulo operators are identical to almost all of the other languages that you might have seen. C++, have, of course, has non-primitive data types or objects. Uh, string is the most common object that a lot of people will use in their programming. And of course, we'll also see some containers or data structures like vector and unordered map later on in the CDs of presentations. 
The string class is one of the most often ones. It has many, many methods in it. It's best to refer to online documentation. Google for std string and pick up the website that has enccpreference.com. So make sure you pick up the ENCPP reference. And then when you scroll down, you'll see all of the methods associated with the class. And you can, and you'd see many methods. Let's say you want to look substring, click on substring. Notice that all of the methods have examples in code that you can actually modify. And you can run these programs after you modify them. So you can type different programs, run them, look at the output, so you can see how uh, these methods and such behave. And of course, there are many methods in the string class. I encourage you to take a quick look at them. And of course, keep in mind, they all have examples that you can run and uh, see how they work. So it's a very convenient way to learn about operations by running the examples in the documentation. Keep in mind, the string class uses SISD or uh, unsigned long for indexes. So this permits very long strings. So do not use int for indexes when it comes to strings. Use SISD data type instead. And string also uses a special concept called nPos, or no such position. That's what nPos means, to denote invalid index positions. So rather than using minus one, we prefer to use what are called named constants. So the named constants add more semantic meaning to magic numbers. So we do not type minus one and such. Instead, prefer to use no such position or nPos in your programs. Now let's look at a simple C++ program. A C++ program will start with including some of the common uh, libraries via the pound include statement at the top of the file. Each program ultimately should have one main method, which is the primary function that starts off all of the operations in the program. You would define uh, all of the variables that you need. Prefer to define and declare variables where you're using them. And of course, C++ does allow you to use global variables, but avoid using global variables. Global variables are problematic in large software systems. So you should get in the habit of avoiding or not using global variables. Outputs in C++ are performed using the stream insertion operator or the less than less than operator. Notice that it's two characters. You type less than, less than right next to each other for stream insertion. And you would typically use the standard C out or console output stream to print information. Notice how multiple uh, variables and constant strings are all printed by CDs of less than, less than um, it, operators. That's the general convention of printing information in C++. Also notice the use of the std endl named constant. This named constant enables printing um, new line characters, but it also flushes the output immediately. So your output will appear immediately on the console. And it's helpful because in some cases, particularly if you're running over the network and such, there might be delays in getting the output. And in some cases, it is handy to have std endl consistently used. Notice how input is done using the stream extraction operator, which is the greater than, greater than operator. That means you type two greater than right after each other. And you will typically use the console input or C in stream to read data from the user. This is where the user would type uh, input at the keyboard and press the enter key. Notice how multiple values are read using one statement. Each one of these input values must be separated by one or more white spaces. A white space can be a tab, an actual space, or a new line. So the libraries automatically take care of reading the data immaterial of how many white spaces are entered between successive inputs that are entered by the user. There is also a special library helper method called std quoted. This helps to parse out quotation marks or read inputs from the user uh, where the user has typed quotation marks and includes multiple words. Normally, you would read only one word at a time, but with std quoted, it'll handle situations where the user wants to type multiple words by placing them between quotation marks. Stood quoted will remove the quotation marks and you'll get only the words between the quotation marks. Note that since the stream extraction operator handles white spaces, inputs can be typed in many different forms. So you can type inputs with just one blank space or a tab character between each other and then press the enter key. 
or you can type inputs with many blank spaces and quotation marks and press the enter key and, and the uh, libraries will parse it out correctly. Or you can even type inputs in multiple separate lines because a new line is a white space. So you can even type inputs in multiple separate lines and the libraries would handle them correctly. So that stream extraction operator gives you all of these features. So it is one of the most convenient ways to process inputs in C++. The main function in C++ must return an integer value. This return value from the main is called the exit code. And the exit code value is interpreted by the operating system and rest of the system in the following manner. If the exit code is zero, that means the program successfully completed and, there is, and overall the run of the program was successful. If the exit code is non-zero, that indicates some error occurred during the runtime of the program. So returning zero on a success is important and returning non-zero in case of errors or failures is also important. So you're able to convey to the operating system the outcome of running this program. Now, when you compile and run this program, it'll prompt you for inputs. Um, the user inputs are shown in green, so the user enters some inputs, and then this program prints some basic information about the inputs back to the user. It's just a simple example. Now, let's see how we can compile and run this example. C++ programs are just simple text files, so you can use any text editor type of C++ program. However, it is highly, highly recommended you use an integrated development environment like uh, Visual Studio, NetBeans, Eclipse. There are so many of them that you can pick up and work with, but do use an IDE uh, when you're working with C++ as it makes your life a lot easier. In material of how you type out the C++ program, the program needs to be compiled to convert it into machine code so it can directly run on the CPU. Here we'll be looking at an example of compiler running under Linux using the GNU compiler collection. So here you'll use the G++ compiler and give it a few options. Here you're selecting the use of C++ 2014 standard by specifying dash std equals C++ 14. You will specify the source file that you've typed in. Typically, you will have the .cpp extension. And then you will generate the output or the machine code into another file, which is the executable file. You can give any name for the source and executable files, but typically you'll keep them coordinated. And in Linux, executable files typically do not have any extensions. Once your program compiles successfully, you can run the executable file by typing dot slash hello. Keep in mind, you should be running executables and not the source code because the source code cannot be run. Instead, you should compile it, generate the executable, and then run the executable. In the previous slide, we looked at some of the flags to use for, with G, G++. Those were the minimum flags. Typically, you lose a couple more additional flags when you're compiling programs. For example, you should always throw in the dash G option to enable debugging of programs. Without the dash G flag, uh, the debugger will not work correctly or give you all of the information for debugging a program. You should also always use the dash W all. Uh, this is report all warnings flag. So warnings in C++ are indicative of potential problems in your program. So it is always a good idea to compile your programs and ensure there are no warnings in it. Oftentimes, you will also want to further optimize your program. This is where the compiler optimizations will kick in. The C++ compiler has very many powerful optimizations. So by default, you'll use, uh, you will not use it for debugging because optimizations can sometimes interfere with debugging. But once your program is ready debugged and it's ready to go into production, you should compile it with optimizations enabled and use the optimized executable in general for general purpose operations on a daily basis. Having looked at the data types, sometimes you may need to convert between strings to numbers or numerical data types. In C++, you use the std to string method to convert standard data types to their string equivalents. Uh, conversely, you would use methods like uh, std stoi for string to integer or stol for string to long and stod for string to double conversions um, to convert strings to their numeric counterparts. So keep these methods to string and std stoi in mind uh, so that it's easy for you to convert between strings and numbers. 
C++ provides pretty standard conditional operations where you can do comparisons using less than, greater than, double equal to, less than, equal to, greater than, equal to operators. Note that you can also use the ampersand, ampersand, and and or operators to create more complex Boolean expressions where they are needed. If else statements are pretty standard, so you have an if block and an else block, and you can keep combining if and else uh, blocks to create more complex logic. In this example, note that variables a and b are strings, but even though they are strings, we are simply using standard comparison operators. We are not using any special methods and such that you may have to in other languages. So using these standard comparison operators for all data types streamlines coding and makes overall interpretation and understanding of programs much easier. So you should always try and use the standard conditional operators for comparisons in C++. Let's look at another example, a little bit more sophisticated. Here we'll be specifically looking at the use of the getLine method to read an entire line of input, which can include multiple words. It reads all of that information, including blank spaces that the user might have entered until the user entered a new line character. In this one, it's reading the entire line from standard input. And then rest of the logic basically extracts the first and last word from the input. It also handles um, cases where there's only one line, one word input in a given line of input. Um, I'm not gonna trace through this logic, but spend some time to look at the logic so that you can get the hang of some of the methods like substring, find, and notice the use of the no such position or nPOS named constant for comparison, so on and so forth. And of course, when you compile and run this program, you enter many words, it'll print the first and last word. So trace through the operations of this program or try to compile and run it to see how this program operates. Once we get the conditionals done, the next most commonly used construct in programming are loops. C++ provides many standard looping constructs. So there's a traditional while loop where the body of the while loop is uh, repeated until the condition uh, is as long as the condition is true. Uh, it, notice how the while loop is formatted. Notice the spacing and the curly brackets to define the body of the while loop. Oftentimes, you'll also use a standard for loop uh, there. It iterates over a fixed range of values. So the for loop basically has the construct where you define the control variable in the for loop. You specify the condition and then you increment the loop variable as shown in this example. In, more, in most common cases, you will prefer to use the range-based for loop. This is the preferred for loop. Notice how the range-based for loop basically says, iterate over every character in, st in the string stars and perform some operation with that character. So this range-based for loop is the most preferred uh, form of the for loop. If you can use it, you prefer that one over any other loop. But in some cases, you may have to revert to the while loop or the standard for loop. Again, um, in this example, note how we can access strings as if they were arrays. This is because string is an array of characters. And also in C++, strings are mutable. That means we can go directly modify characters in them. Some of the languages will not permit you to modify strings, but, but in C++, you can modify strings and work with them as if they are array of characters. Also notice the use of the size D data type. This is not int. If you use int here, you the compiler will generate a warning saying that you're using incompatible data type. So make sure you use size D data type when operating with strings. Now let's look at another example. Uh, assume that we want to read uh, three pieces of data. Let's say you want to read some element information where I want to read the name of the element like hydrogen, maybe its atomic weight and its symbol. Notice how the um, um, code is implemented in the main method. We have defined our variables, elements, symbol, as strings, and atomic weight as integer. And then we directly read the values. Here we're using the std quoted method to get rid of any quotations that might be present um, around the element, and also handle element names that have multiple words in them. Again, keep in mind, the values are separated by white spaces, and white spaces can be tabs, just blank spaces and new lines. So inputs can, in theory, be supplied in many different formats. Here it's just showed as a simple column to illustrate an example. 
Now let's consider the case where instead of just reading one line of input, we want to read many lines of inputs. So we want to read many element informations and process them. In C++, once you have one line of input processed, to handle multiple lines of input, you simply wrap that line of code with a while loop and you can now start processing multiple lines of input. Again, let's review this. This is how you process one line of input by using the stream extraction operator. But now you want to process multiple lines. So all you do is simply throw in a while loop around that statement and you can now start processing multiple lines of input. So here you should get in the habit of using a while loop like this for processing inputs. You read this while loop as, as long as we have inputs to process, keep processing them. Keep in mind here, the while loop keeps running as long as the user has inputs to enter. And you as a user can tell or inform the program you're done entering inputs by pressing Control and D together on a separate line um, and pressing the enter key to indicate to the program that you have completed entering all of the inputs. So remember the Control D or logical end of file character that you have to enter. Now let's use that concept again to count the number of lines of input a user is entering. This program is very straightforward. It has a count variable. We keep incrementing the count as long as you have a line to read and we print the output. Yeah. So here this while loop is the one that does the work. Again, you read this while loop as, as long as the loop we have inputs to process, keep processing this. So the program keeps on reading line by line from the user until the user enters control D. And notice how the, where the control D is um, entered. You enter the lines of input, and then on a separate line, you press control and D to indicate logical end of file. So far, we have worked with variables whose values can change. The const keyword in C++ is used to define constants, where uh, constants are variables or objects whose value cannot change after they are initialized. So it's always a good idea to initialize variables. And then when you define them as constant, the values can no longer change. Keep in mind, const is not the same as final in Java. For those of you who are Java programmers, the const and final are definitely not the same. In general, you should get in the habit of using const keyword liberally through your program. All local variables that, are, that you're not planning to modify must be defined as being const. And soon we will see how to use const for passing arguments or to method parameters as well. Here's an example usage of const. Notice how the const is used here. Variables whose values are not changing are all defined as const. This is because const eases tracing of operations and, and you minimize unintended defects or bugs in your program, particularly when the program is going to be used by other people and maintenance or modifications of the program don't have unforeseen side effects. So use const liberally in your programs. Now let's summarize what we have reviewed in this presentation so far. So given a general scalar variable, this is like a, a single value, uh, you should never use C++ operator in C++. Uh, in C++. The new operator is reserved for library builders, so do not use new keyword in your programs. That's just a bad idea. In general, when you want to read inputs, prefer the stream extraction or greater than greater than operator. If you want to read a whole line of input, use get line method. And then if you want to handle quotations, use the std quoted method. So the stream extraction operator, get line, and std quoted will be able to cover 90% of the use case that you will come across. If you ever want to write output, use the stream insertion operator or less than less than operator to print the values. Always use the standard comparison operators for comparison. At least start with them. Don't try and make your conditions complicated. Keep things simple and straightforward. So use the standard comparison operators, whether it's primitive data types, strings, objects. Always try and use them first before you start doing something more complicated. So it's always a good rule of thumb to use the standard operators in C++. All right, let's wind up this presentation. We still need to learn a few more concepts before we can define, uh, develop more complex programs. So in the next part of the sequence, now that we have some basics, we'll start looking into functions and methods. Then we'll do some work with input output streams, particularly for processing file data. 
And then we look at a little bit more sophisticated data types of containers like vectors and unordered maps. And then we'll wrap up the series of presentations with a brief introduction and overview of object-oriented programming.